Welcome back to my channel. I thought I would give you a little midweek video to give you my two cents on the new HBO uh, movie version of Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. So I couldn't see it the day it came out because I had an important school event, but I saw it as soon as I could, which was Monday night. So I am ready to talk about this movie. So first of all, spoilers. There are going to be lots of spoilers in this review about the book itself. I will try not to ruin, you know, everything in the movie for those who want to see it and be surprised at a few things, but I will be ruining some things. I'll be talking about them. So please, 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 if you have not read the book or you don't know the story, please get out of get out of here because I hate spoilers so much and I don't want to be the cause of any of them. But I know that this is a really well-loved book and for a reason, so I'm going to talk about it as though you already know what is what. So there are a lot of differences between the book and the new movie. Again, this is the 2018 HBO version starring uh, Michael B. Jordan from the Black Panther movie. So there are a couple good changes, I thought. Uh, the first one I want to talk about and probably the um, best change that I liked was Beatty. His character is played by Michael Shannon, I think that's his name. Uh, and he did a stellar job. I feel like he nailed the character. He quotes the really famous works all the time, like the character does in the book. And he has that gritty intensity. He's really jaded from everything that he's learned and uh, feels like books have betrayed him and all of their conflicting opinions have made him kind of this shell of a man that is only... Uh, only his only recourse is violence and domination and these really negative things so in order to make him more understandable they show him in his house pretty frequently at the end of the day just writing down on a little slip of paper a, a sentence or two and they're all famous quotations there were a couple that i had to look up because i didn't know all of them right off the top of my head but they are all famous quotations that he must have seen in a book somewhere that just haunt him. It's something that speaks to his present condition. So I thought that was kind of cool. And then at the end, he at one point makes this flower. He folds a flower out of all these little pieces of paper and he, he lights it on fire. So that was awesome. I liked his character. When he's first introduced, he is fighting with Montag. They don't do a whole lot of that at all in the book. but. Uh, as soon as they're finished, his first line is, he who has a why to fight can bear almost any how, which is really very beady. I thought that was fantastic. I believe that's Nietzsche, just tweaked from he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. So very cool. Uh, they, I also liked how they updated the parlor walls. So you know since you've read the book that the parlor walls are like basically this, these massive TV screens that take up the entire wall. So in the book, Mildred, Montag's wife, will watch these parlor walls and interact with them uh, as though they're her family more than, more than Montag is. So they do pronounce it Montag in the movie. I've heard it both ways, but Montag is how I'm going to say it from now on. So the parlor walls, they kind of were they, the precursor to huge flat screen TVs and all of that. So the movie updates the parlor walls to be more like smartphone walls almost. And so you can interact with them and there's live streaming and, and things like that that I think really work with the world that Ray Bradbury would have created if he had written the book in more modern times. Going along with the parlor walls situation, the parlor walls, there's also apparently this two-way kind of viewing ability because sometimes you get these shots that appear to be either from a security camera or from the point of view of the parlor wall itself looking down on the action. And I didn't mind that at all. It felt really natural for that to be the case, but it was only one of several ways that the movie pays homage to 1984 as well, which is another book you've probably read if you've read Fahrenheit 451. If you haven't, you should go out and, and read that one too. Very different, very freaky, um, but also an excellent dystopian work. So the parlor walls are almost like telescreens in that way. They're, they're being watched 
It's also like 1984 because the firemen in the story have these three slogans, and they're not exactly the same as the 1984 ones. War is peace, freedom is slavery, uh, ignorance is strength. It's three different ones, and it went by kind of quickly, so I didn't get the chance to write them down, but it has a very similar cadence to it. So there was that. Let me check my notes here for a second. Oh, and then the other, the third way that it's kind of a 1984 mashup in places is that they mention how language has been reduced, how there used to be thousands of languages and now there are something like 80 in the world and that was intentional on the part of the government. So that is also 1984, not so much Fahrenheit 451. There's, there's a moment when in the book Beatty does say languages are reduced but it's this really passing comment talking about how basically everything with substance has been reduced into this vanilla pudding of of uh, things that don't matter as much. Uh, two other things that I liked about the movie before I go on to the things that I did not like so much and probably are the reasons why the reviews are not coming back super great. I liked that they had Montag, Montag in, sh in line for Beatty's job in the movie. I thought that that raised the stakes and gave him more buy-in with the firemen. You see that in the book as well, but it was just a more visual, uh, well, I don't know, visual, but a more cinematic way to get that idea across without um, having to see into his mind or have him talk much about it. The relationship between Beatty and Montag really is the best one in the, in the movie, I think. There's a relationship between Montag and Clarice as well, but I'll get to that later. And then finally, I really liked how they kept in many of the original lines, like when the old woman is burned with her books. Remember, I gave you the spoiler. She does say, play the man, Master Ridley, and that whole line that she says in the book, uh, in the movie as well. So that was nice. Montag also says at one point, uh, it's a pleasure to burn. He's, in, he's being filmed as he's burning things and he turns to the camera and, and says that uh, with a little curse word, but I'm not going to curse on this channel, probably, so uh, you can just watch that. Yes, if you're planning on on showing this to a class, if you are a teacher, maybe, uh, make sure that you watch the movie first. There is an F-bomb, a couple of them that are dropped in the movie, so just, you know, buyer beware kind of a thing. Okay, as far as not good changes, um, one of the things, this wasn't exactly a change, but it was something that I didn't really appreciate at times, was how heavy-handed it was. I mean, the book is obviously all about, you know, being anti-censorship and the value of great literature and great art and the value of thinking rather than just chasing fun and all those good things that we come to love the book for. But I felt that the movie was, it shoved it in your face at times. So, for instance, the opening crawl, the credits, it goes on for quite a long time, actually. It felt like an old movie, almost, with how long the, the opening sequence was. Just goes thing after thing, you know, famous work after famous work being burned, and then you you have that smash cut with uh, the, the Nazis and other book-burning groups, and you see all these important works going up in flames, and I, I got to the point where I thought, okay, I've got it. The first couple times it really it really is affecting to see those things all going up in flames, but after about three minutes you're thinking, all right, so is there a story in here somewhere? There's also a more heavy-handed political bent that, um, if it were just generally that way, I don't think I would have minded, but it was very uh, it, modern, topical. For instance, one of the slogans, not one of the three 1984-ish slogans, but another slogan that the firemen have is, uh, well, let me read it, make sure I get it right, here. Ah, yes. Time to burn for America again. That's what they yell sometimes when they're um, flame-throwing these books. Time to burn for America again. It would, I mean, obviously it's reminiscent of the, of the Trump slogan, and whatever you think of, um, President Trump. I still felt like it was a little too rooted in our specific time rather than making it more universal. So it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way that they were trying to be, um, make such a specific comment in the present about some of the issues rather than letting people kind of decide, oh, okay, so this is, this is something that could happen in this time or, you know, in this place and making it the universal idea that, that we get in the original, in the original book. 
So that was kind of annoying. Uh, so the problems with the movie, there, there are a few, but they fall into two categories for me. One was unnecessary complication. They added things that did not need to be added. Like they added lingo, like it's eels versus natives. The natives are the people who are doing what they're supposed to do, just having a grand old time. And eels are the subversive people who own the different books and, and music and things like that. Um, the books are called graffiti, which took me a second to catch on to. There is a term omnis in the movie that is not in the book that ends up being really central to the plot and I think kind of undermines the main idea that it's people who carry around all this information. It's not just the book sitting on the shelf. See, all my books sitting on the shelf. It's not just the books sitting on the shelf that are the information. It's when we take in that information. So at the end of Fahrenheit 451, remember the spoiler warning, at the end of, of Fahrenheit 451, in the book, everything blows up and Montag finds that group of, sort of rebels, you know, former English teachers and random riffraff outside of town, and he becomes a book, the keeper of Ecclesiastes, I believe, and then there are all, all the other people are the keepers of one or two books, and that is who they are. They're the ones who carry that torch, which is such a cool idea, and that does not come across in the movie at all, because they have Omnis, this book uh, database thing, and they have one guy with the rebel group who has memorized 13,000 books, I think. So he's, he's the savant, which would be an interesting idea, except that it's so far removed from what Bradbury, I think, had intended. So those are some complications. The group in general, that, that outsider group, is also complicated by its membership qualifications, which you don't get in the book. In the book, it's just, hey, you know, do you agree generally with us? Cool, you can you can survive with us, we'll share our food. And there's this humanity, this human connection, which is, again, so much of the point. When, in the book, Montag comes across this group with Granger and the other outsiders, he sees, oh, look, the fire isn't there to, to burn, to destroy. The fire is there to warm and is more of a positive thing. And and people are doing things that are positive with their hands and he's making all these connections about things that are constructive and positive and the connections that these people are making are real as opposed to say Mildred in the parlor walls. Not so much in this group. This group is a little bit more militant feeling because, and I am going to give this away because it was weird, in the movie the group tells Montag that in order to be inaugurated into their their group of people, that he has to go and shoot somebody in another room. He has to shoot a fireman. He has to kill someone. I was thinking, what? That's dumb. I mean, in the book we know that he does kill some people, but it's not like that was some rite of passage to get him into the group or anything like that. And so he is told to kill this fireman in the other room. So unnecessary complications happened. All this lingo, all this extra stuff. And then the other category of things that I thought could have gone better are the unnecessary cuts. And there were some significant ones. So if you are very attached to the idea of Mildred, say goodbye. Because she is no more. Now I kind of expected this. I thought, okay, this is an HBO movie, A Fahrenheit 451, they've got to kind of spice things up, or they probably will feel that they have to. So they're probably going to make Clarice the love interest. I was right. They did make Clarice the love interest. She is not 17 years old, this, you know, innocent teenager. She is a world-weary, I don't know, early 20-something. She reminded me a lot of the, the girl in The Born Identity, actually. She had a very, very similar vibe, kind of on the run and all of that. So now Mildred is gone and Clarice is there instead. No mechanical hound, no Faber. I mean, maybe 
There was a person who showed up who could have maybe been Faber, Faber but I, I doubt it. He's there for about half a second. And the thing I will not spoil for you fully, but that I would just give you a warning about, is that the ending is completely different. Completely different from the book. Now, as a movie in its own right, I didn't have too many problems with it. I mean, it was enjoyable. The acting was pretty good. Especially Beatty. Again, I thought Michael B. Jordan did a good job, but um, for me, Beatty was the standout because Montag's motivation past being really curious about these books, you know, what takes him from curiosity to actually breaking with everything that he's known, I didn't feel like that kind of connection fully worked. Uh, so anyway, the movie was pretty good, but do be aware, if you are a big fan of Fahrenheit 451, do not expect it to be exactly the same, because it is not. It is not at all. They, they took some extreme liberties. It was loosely based on Fahrenheit 451. Definitely pays homage to the original, but is uh, also a lot different. So watch it. Let me know what you think. Uh, post your ideas in the comments, whether you liked it or didn't like it or what. And if you like this video, make sure to subscribe and like, and I will see you on Monday.